are a couple of quick things that I want to address from Andy's presentation there. Um, one is some clarification on one of the things he talked about, and two are some points where I disagree. Uh, three are some points where I disagree. Um, I will tell you, I do like BACnet. I've worked with, uh, I don't know, a dozen or more communication protocols in building automation systems, and BACnet is definitely one of my favorites. Okay? That being said, from a realistic standpoint, using BACnet as the system integration tool for an entire building is a, is a fairly far horizon idea, if not a pipe dream. I wish that weren't the case, but just the kind of data that we talk about in different systems does not necessarily transport across as directly or as smoothly as, um, trying to think of a nice way to put this, um, some people think, okay? Um, and, and Ted has been around me for long enough. He knows that I, I have a tendency to throw people, and Larry's been around me long enough, I have a tendency to throw um, engineers and architects under the bus on occasion, um, or, you know, on an hourly basis. I, I think I might be um, overdue. So, and, and it's not because I'm throwing shade at them. It's because sometimes how things work in theory and in practice are vastly different, okay? And I would categorize a lot of the people who are pushing behind BACnet right now to live much more heavily in the theory world than the practical world. And that's despite the fact that they've got manufacturers on board. Um, they do have users as well, but yeah. So I agree with the ideas behind it. I don't, it, it is definitely not as simple of a topic as they are trying to make it out to be. Systems integration to the level that he was talking about has a level of complexity that is absolutely astronomical. Um, not just because of the data types within these systems, but the inherent levels of security are very different behind the systems as well. Um, so it, the way he explained it made it seem very simple and straightforward, and there is huge arguments for making it that way. But the challenges for accomplishing that are just as immense as the reasons to do it. So I'm not arguing against doing it, I'm just putting the realistic standpoint out there that it's a real challenge to get where they want to go. Do I think BACnet will get there? I think probably so. It, it's got enough push behind it that I think it will get there. Okay. Robert. Peter. Is there any real benefit to integrating security and uh, elevators, so mechanical systems? Peter's asking if there's any real benefit to integrating these very disparate systems like security and elevators, lighting control with climate control? And the answer to that is yes. Um, there is a really classic um, story that is often told when you're talking about this level of integration, okay? And that is that a, a worker shows up to the office for a, um, well, now we would adapt it and say a zo overseas Zoom meeting, okay? So that they're coming in at a really odd time when the building is not typically occupied. And they walk up to the door and they scan their badge, okay? That badge scan goes through the security system, checks all the normal things. Do they have access to the building at this time? Yes, they do. Unlocks the door, okay? And this is where that integration thing starts to happen. Um, your lighting control system kicks on and 
it lights the path to the elevator. Okay, so we're not lighting the entirety of first floor or the entirety of the lobby. We're just lighting the path to the elevator because that's the most efficient thing we can do. The elevator, tied in with the security system, knows that this person only has access to this floor at this time. So they go up to the seventh floor where their office is, where again the lighting control system lights the path predominantly to their office, or as close within the zone as they can. Once they get to their office, the control system was informed as soon as they scanned in at the door that, hey, this person's coming in, so where are they going to be? Their office. So that takes their zone out of unoccupied mode and drops it into occupied mode and starts playing catch-up. So that's the kind of argument for that type of system. Um, from a practicality standpoint, unless somebody is as important as the president of the company, we very rarely are actually willing to spend the money to get to that level of granularity. Because while it is possible, possible and practical do not always live in the same building. So, Wait, John? Well, that kind of granularity for that particular task is not effective. But that kind of granularity is what's going to be required for so much of the efficiency thing, so for the next layer of efficiency. And we have been avoided a lot of that granularity because of the lack of bandwidth. Just sitting there and the thing we're hearing, let's say, in Lori Flivermore, that they have trouble collecting temperature data on one minute level, levels because you know, the bandwidth, people are sitting there watching cat videos on their phone. And it's like, you know, you, what, what's going on? There's got to be, at some point, there's got to be a, a change in that. We can't stay 10, 30 years behind forever and still achieve what we need to achieve. Economically, I, it's going to be driven by energy prices. Absolutely agree, Robin. Um, the fact that we have used excuses in the past, um, bandwidth for data transfer rates, or um, just the lack of processing power at the end devices as our excuses, has really effectively evaporated. Right now, we um, are standing on the excuse, like we do with a lot of things, of it's not cost effective. And what might be a better way to phrase that is it's not cost effective yet. But you're right. Going to that level of granularity of control is where we will need to be um, at some point in the future, or maybe it could be argued that we should have been there at a point in the past. So, Sean. Yeah, wouldn't there be some code-related obstacles to get around with this kind of systems integration? You know, like having HVAC and fire controls on the same network? Yes. So, the code compliance issues are not insubstantial. Um, what ends up happening in those type of situations is um, very frequently that we will have devices that have to go through multiple certifications. So, for example, a um, building automation system controller may initially go through a, the BTL certification process. Um, and then after that, it may go through UL certification to become a smoke-rated control device. Um, and after that, it may go through you know, five other certifications to be able to deal with, you know, various things. Um, and that is a really excellent point and something to discuss with your students, especially when you start talking about things like air handler controls, because you will write, run into specifications where, or implementations in the real world where somebody is using um, the like a backnet communication pathway to communicate a, an effective fire alarm to a controller. Okay, it happens, but if all of the devices on involved in that communication are not certified by UL to be smoke and fire control rated, then it is not up to code, um, and that is not always caught. 
but it is a something that any building automation system technician should be very aware of and that's the code limitations of their devices so that's a great point sean lanny so i'm just curious uh, again this can go out to anyone when uh, because you know these controllers are such wonderful and universal types of devices i mean they're used all the not just guard how much how much misuse of these types of controllers is there actually so when you say, when you're asking how much misuse there is in industry, can you elaborate on what not you mean? Not designed for their, you know, not, not used for <laughs> what they've been appropriately designed for. Absolutely. Um, I, I've seen it numerous times. Um, I've seen DDC controllers that weren't smoke rated being used to control um, exhaust evacuation fans or fire smoke um, dampers for smoke clearing. I've seen, actually, the company I used to work for built a, um, or did the controls work on a semi-trailer sized smoker for smoking, for competition meat smoking, um, using an easy I.O. controller. Um, you will see... By itself, you know, that makes a wonderful lighting controller. Yes. Yes. You, you're absolutely right. And you get to the heart of where we are at right now in the controls industry, that most of our controllers can do just about any of the tasks we need, um, with a few exceptions. Things like card being able to read and interpret the data from a card um, reader. That is a fairly complex task. Um, most of our climate control systems don't have a controller that's compatible with that. But as long as you're not dealing with that kind of super complex level of data, most of our controllers can do anything. So whether that's actually a misuse of the controller, as long as you're not breaking code, is it a misuse or is it just an adaptation? I would agree. Isn't the paradigm kind of switching though? I mean, a lot of people are working at home now, so the office building is getting to be more of a dinosaur. So, you know, we're down into more manufacturing facilities or much more neat facilities, which, you know, they primarily use Spot Bus and their, you know, other protocols. So, you know, could BACnet kind of basically fall apart? Just because there's no need. Um, so, the changing world. I, I see what you're saying, um, but the thing to keep in mind is that even those manufacturing facilities, you're right, in manufacturing and process control, Modbus is the king um, communication protocol. Um, or, or Profibus, yep. So those are the king there. But the climate control systems, the lighting control systems within that building are still outside of that zone. Very few people want to pay the cost to install a PLC, programmable logic controller based system, to control their climate controls. Um, about the only groups typically who do put forth that kind of money for uh, climate controls are data centers. But the systems are in an industrial environment. You don't have the fine lighting control as an office building. That's you don't know, have the fine HAC control. That's why you know it's smaller. You know you have more open areas. Tell that so, to Ferrari. But I, th I think that uh, what, what he's pointing towards is, is true. You know, the offices are becoming smaller. But I also think that uh, the buildings that are there. They're still going to be used. They're just going to be dividing them up into smaller spaces and running them out that way. So the building is still going to be occupied. The need for the lighting and everything is just, it's, it's still going to be there. It's just going to be the continued evolution of the buildings yeah, as they exist. Instead of, having, instead of a company owning a room floor, you know, one 
content with that if you work with somebody else going to move in. Yeah. Being a little bit more purposeful with the use. Question, you know, what's the need for back net or what would be the future? What needs to be addressed is the bandwidth concept of any mod bus or pro B or whatever else is not shutting their mouth and crashing that person's network. <laughs> and that, I think that's the answer to all of that. Back then it has a way of communicating without destroying an existing network that's right now. Yeah. That's a BACnet is inherently intended to be a very low um, system requirement protocol. And then the guys that play with the addressing within BACnet to make sure that an integrator can't write this up or bring it over the whole other game in the market to play. Which they can control the whole campus with their controls. Yes, and we are going to fix talk. everything that create the same problems, like space balls all over again. Yeah, we are we are going to hit on that topic because I've got some slides about what BACnet is and what BACnet isn't, and Andy gave me a great intro for that. I do want to pivot at this point to because um, the point that was brought up about adoption for BACnet really segues into another one of the things and relates to the question that Larry asked in relation to how they collected that data for their Add up or adoption rate for BACnet worldwide. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to call baloney on that graph because I've seen a very similar graph from Echelon, uh, the company that makes lawn, also claiming that in like the 2016 2017 time period that they had a market share of over 60%. So I'm sorry, you cannot have two, com two compete comp competing groups end up with over 60% market share at the same time. I mean, new math is new math, but it, it doesn't, it, it's not that funny. What was the company Peak? It's, I think it's Peak HMI. You ever hear of it? No, I'm Peak not familiar. HMI is a company that built its entire front end, just in the front end, all the way to the front end. And it accepts all protocols. Nice. Which is probably amazing. I'll look into it. Texas. Texas boys made something. <laughs> all right. Um, so the next one that I held issue with is, and Andy said this very specifically, is BACnet is always backwards compatible. So what that translates to, I, Anybody in here have an Xbox or a PlayStation? I figure most people do have one or the other somewhere in their home. Well, right now we're up to PlayStation 5 and effectively Xbox 4. And your Xbox 4 will not play your Xbox One games. Your PS5 will not play your PS1 games. That's the concept of backwards compatibility. Can I play my old games on the new system? Okay. Largely, BACnet is backwards compatible to a very finite point. It is not backwards compatible to a, past a certain point because they made some very significant changes about that initial conversation between devices. Um, basically, they eliminated the requirement for a device to give a name. It could just basically give its address and its device type. But if you have an older client that requires it to give a name and you have a new device that doesn't have a name value, they will not talk to each other. I have, I have dealt with that specifically between an Andover BACnet BCX and a Carrier Chiller. The Andover BACnet BCX was the older standard, the Carrier was the newer, and so the Carrier Chiller did not have a name. And so the Andover controller kept asking, hey, what's your name? Carrier controller. Hey, what's your name? Eventually, the Andover controller just stopped asking. So as much as I would love to believe that, and I'm sure you know, that was literally 10 years ago or more. So do I think they've probably solved a lot of those issues? Yes. But with any system that's been running as long as BACnet has, you cannot solve all of them. So 
And I will acknowledge that is a very specific scenario, but I got to put it out there. Okay. Making sense so far? Okay. Mentioned and Connie asked about it um, was tagging, data tagging. How many people are familiar with what data tagging is or have heard the term or uh, group Haystack? Few people. Okay. Data tagging is something that we've been doing in IT for 15, 20 years, where we are associating metadata, or literally data about the information that we're gathering with the data itself. So a great example would be, we're monitoring the temperature of this room, right? Well, that point in the controller has a name, that data point gets transferred up to the supervisory controller for this area. Okay. Well, if we add data tagging to it, then at some point we're going to tag this data or this room temperature with the fact that one, it is a room temperature. It's not a discharge air temperature. It's not a return air temperature. It's a room temperature. We could also tag it with the fact that it is a room temperature associated with room 114. We could associate it with air handler 2 that this room gets its air from. We could associate it with building 25. And historically in control systems, to accomplish most of that, we had to include that with its name. So you had the ability to have names that were as long as your arm if you wanted to include that data. So. That, of course, is inherently problematic. So we started talking about adding tag data tagging to our data like IT was doing somewhere in the range of about 10, 15 years ago. Haystack was one of the organizations that was a forefront leader in that movement um, and still largely are. So the fact that they are considering or working to add that as a default um, capability within BACnet is very, very interesting. I knew ASHRAE was working on data tagging standards. I did not know that they were going to try and mesh it into BACnet. From a practicality standpoint, that's a really interesting idea, but a really complex idea, and I'm curious to see if it will successfully pull off or turn into a mess of spaghetti. Either is a very viable option. Rob, that's why they use haystack and you can make the all of in in the Niagara. Yep. Or whether it's AX transform. Yeah. That's where I learned a lot about the haystack and the tag notes this and help to build the graphics and stuff. And that go along with the end and stuff. Yes, and that's that's a great point, Russell. Um, Haystack created a bunch of standards for t data tagging that other companies could implement. Um, Niagara did it when they transitioned to Niagara 4. Um, I think Siemens' current version of DeSego does. I know ALC implements some form of data tagging. Um, I'm not sure if they're using Haystack or not. But one of the big advantages, not only do we know that that room temperature is associated with room 114, but you can also build things very quickly and automatically when you have those data tags. Because you could write a rule in your supervisory controller that every room temperature automatically creates a um, data log or a trend log that logs room temperature data every 15 minutes. You could automatically create a room temperature alarm. So as the minute it goes below 65 or above 80, it's going to go into alarm. You can use data tagging at a device level or a VAV to do things like automatically create graphics for you. So there is some really significant automation capabilities associated with data tagging 
as well as higher level thinking like system learning, um, automated fault detection that, that really benefit very, very significantly from those metadata points. So, sorry. Got a little further into that one than I expected, but I liked it. Okay, so do those make sense? All right. Um, one thing that he didn't mention that I, uh, or did mention, but just barely in passing, was BACnet PlugFest events, okay? Where companies bring in their new, uh, new toy to test with anybody else who shows up. I, those are really cool events, um, and I think that would be something that an advanced controls class could really get a kick out of by going to as a field trip, if there's one in your area. I live in Omaha. Nobody comes here except you folks, which I appreciate. So I, I'll never get to pull it off, um, but they do very frequently show up like around the ASHRAE conferences the, and the ANSI conferences and things like that. Um, and for those of you who live in areas like Chicago or close to Chicago, New York, um, California, uh, San Francisco I know has plug fests, um, LA has plug fests. So. If you get a chance to go to one of those, I would definitely encourage you to do so, um, but I would suggest that it might be worth dragging some students to too. All right, took care of that, those are done. So we, Romero asked who tracks port numbers? IANA, the Internet Assignment Numbers Authority. Okay, IANA, I-A-N-A dot org is the website that I've got up here. Um, and they track a lot of this really kind of deep, useful network data, like port numbers for different protocols. They also track domains. So if Google has registered a domain, they've blocked off a set of IP addresses, IANA knows about it, okay? If your institution has a public-facing IP address, that, or multiple IP addresses that they are not leasing directly from an ISP, then it's going to be recorded in IANA. So, like UC Berkeley shows up on IANA. Google, Microsoft, AT&T, um, Wells Fargo Bank, Union Pacific Railroad. Okay, These are all examples of people who do show up in the IANA um, IP address database. So. It's an interesting thing to go on and kind of just fiddle around and explore. Um, worth writing an assignment around for your students when you get to port numbers. Um, you know, have them go and look up what are the port numbers for BACnet and Modbus. They're in there. It takes a little bit of digging to find them. So you got to kind of play around on the site. Uh, make them find, you know, some big institution within your area find out what their registered domain is, things like that. Not super critical everyday use, but might be kind of fun. Okay. Did that better answer your question, Romero? Excellent. All right. Last up, I used the term LAN. Okay. Hiding my markers from myself. It's normal, don't worry about me. LAN, L-A-N, stands for Local Area Network. Okay, this is what we very frequently refer to the network within a building as, because it's local to that building. When we reach outside of that building, we change the first letter from an L to a W, and it becomes a wide area network. This is a brand new marker, and it's already dying. I'm cursed. 
Okay. Um, there is an additional level of networks, um, or there used to be, I think it was regional area networks, but I think that terminology fell by the wayside a while ago. Everything anymore pretty much covers LANs versus WANs. Okay. So what we will be doing here shortly as an exercise um, will be a LAN exercise. We are going to build out our network. We have our physical media already laid out, and here soon we will deal with the actually setting up the network, configuring our IP addresses, designing the scheme, that kind of thing. And it'll be fairly quick. I'm not going to promise it'll be painless, but we'll try. Okay. Sound fair? Okay. Before we get into that, because I want to build that into our exercise with BACnet, because that's the point when we're going get to get into our controllers, um, and I kind of want to build that momentum and start with the network and just slide right in to continue with the BACnet side. So, if it's alright with you, we're going to talk about BACnet next. Or do my side of the presentation for that. Okay. Did anybody come up with any network related questions while we were listening to Andy. Notice, the, notice a lot of the things he talked about were right along lines with what we had already talked about too. So, All right. Bass communication protocols. Okay. First thing to know, there are about a zillion of them. Okay. When we first started developing DDC controls, direct digital controls, each company base, who decided to step into the market basically wrote their own proprietary communication protocol. Johnson did, Siemens did, Barbara Coleman at that time, which that property is now owned by Schneider Electric, um, Train, everybody wrote their own. Okay. So those are what we refer to as proprietary protocols. And for the most part, if you wanted to talk, for example, to a uh, Metasys Johnson system, you had to be Johnson. The only thing that talked Metasys was Johnson, with very few exceptions. Okay? If you wanted to talk to a train COM3 system, you had to be trained. Um, these protocols still exist, though they are not the norm anymore. Okay, which is very fortunate because, from a customer standpoint, the minute you got Honeywell C bus in your building, you are tied to continue buying Honeywell C bus until you decided you'd had enough and were willing to pony up the cash to change out your entire control system. Until they quit supporting it. Or until they quit supporting it, in which case you had to pony up the cash to do an entire new control system. Or be willing to live with the inconvenience of having two or more control systems in one building. Talk to some government entities about how exciting that is. Um, our VA hospital here in town for a long time ran about seven different control systems in one building. They loved it. Okay? Robert, can I question? Fire away, Ted. So, the way you worded it is that um, these different proprietary software packages are actually not necessarily proprietary more so that they're adopting back this. But the way I understand it, and maybe it's what you meant, is that Metis is still Metis since they, they accept BACnet, or they will broadcast BACnet compatibility. Okay. So, I love that question, Ted. But I wanted to address what you said with that, right off the bat. You said a software system. Okay. We're talking about communication protocols. Okay. You, one of the things that the industry has done a real good job 
in the past about doing is confusing the two, intentionally making it confusing. So for example, if you had a Johnson Metasys system, it was a Metasys system, and the protocol that it used to communicate was also Metasys. Later on, Johnson saw the writing on the wall and realized that their Johnson Metasys system also needed to be able to talk to BACnet devices. Otherwise, they were going to knock themselves out of the effective market. So, do not confuse a manufacturer or a software system with a communication protocol. Okay? That was an excellent question, Ted. It jumps ahead just a little bit to what BACnet isn't, but we will get there. Okay? So, but fantastic question. So after an amount of time, there, there were, we started developing a solution to this roping a customer in and locking them into one company. Um, and one of the tools that became part of our arsenal against that was open communication protocols. Okay. BACnet is a good example of an open communication protocol. Yeah, we'll stick with that. Okay. Um, there are others. Zigbee, not on this list, but is an example. That is one of the premier for smart homes. Okay. It is an open communication protocol. And when I say premier, I mean widely used. I'm not saying that it's good. Okay. You get into home automation, I have opinions about it, and you don't want to hear them today. That's way too long of a conversation. But there are others. Dolly is a lighting control protocol. It's specifically designed for lighting control. It is very, very fast communication protocol. Because if you think about it, when you flip on the light switch, if you can count to two before that light turns on, you're going, wait, what's wrong, right? Okay, so we need something very fast. Dolly is very popular in Europe, by the way, as is KNX. KNX is more a climate controls oriented um, communication protocol. Also needs a lot of daylighting, like uh, window blind. That would make sense. Because again, daylighting systems don't necessarily have to be super fast, but they do need to cooperate. This is not an exhaustive list of proprietary or open protocols. These were literally ones that came off the top of my head. Notice the discrepancy in the length of these lists. Okay. I'm not saying that nobody is still using proprietary protocols because they are. Um, who in here has experience with Niagara? Okay has maybe a Niagara controller, maybe it's a Honeywell Webs controller, or everybody sells them different names. Fox Protocol, that's what Niagara uses. Notice it's proprietary, despite the fact that Niagara would tell you they are the most open system on the market. Still a proprietary protocol, okay? But notice that proprietary is double the length easily of open. Absolutely right. Or Windows. Yeah. Okay. So, I also have kind of a half category here because there are some protocols that live somewhere in between. LAN is a premier example. LAN is technically a proprietary protocol because if you want your VAV controller to talk LAN, you have to go and buy a LAN chip from Echelon, based in Germany. Okay? That's it. Beginning and end of story. If you want it, you've got to buy it from them. So by that definition, it is proprietary. 
you have to buy credits. Yeah, we don't even want to get into that. But Echelon doesn't make a controller. All they make is those communicate, or at least it used to be, all they made was those communication chips and the standard. So they, while they're proprietary, they don't actually have a horse in the market as far as what control company you put in. As long as they're buying lawn chips from them, they're happy. So Echelon sold lawn chips to everybody for years and years and years and still does. So it is still an active communication protocol. It is probably worldwide one of the biggest competitors in building automation to BACnet. Could be. I don't focus on lawn very much because it's more expensive to try and implement in a lab situation for teaching. And if you can teach them back net, they can learn lawn relatively quickly. There are differences. I'm not going to deny that. But um, yeah, yeah. Our um, Air Force base down here is a lawn-based system. So, yeah, there's, there are security reasons to do it, but here in North America, BACnet is king of the hill. Big surprise given that ASHRAE were the ones who and, and developed it. And I don't think there's it. any truth to it, but uh, once it was told that the law and standard was the military standard to support their allies, to allow their European allies to make law. That would be interesting. That would make a lot of sense. Because I know Lon is still a major player in the European building automation groups. So, or was the last time I did any research. Um, another, or other players in this half category are eventually most companies that develop their proprietary standards get rid of the proprietary standard. They, they stop supporting it. And sometime after they stop supporting it, they just kind of dump it out and say, okay, yeah, fine. You can, you can go play with it now. Um, there are exceptions to that, of course. but And when that happens, can you still call it a proprietary system because it's open? The fact that nobody's used it for 20 years is analytical. Although it so. may not be bad if they dump it on the open source You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And that's exactly how Niagara has gotten the ability to talk to so many devices um, for so long, was they would grab up those old open protocol or dropped protocols and write drivers to be able to talk so that you could make a new system talk to an old system. You just had to use their device to go between them. Um, and technically, Modbus may fall into that category. I don't know. Um, because Modbus was originally developed in, Connie, do you know the date? Late 70s, I think. Early, mid-70s, maybe. Um, by a company called Modicon. So it was initially developed within a company, whether it was intended as the open protocol that it has become, or whether it was initially developed and supported and supported and then kicked loose, I don't know. As soon as you get out of building automation systems, once you land in um, uh, process control, generators, um, especially power control um, systems, UPSs, things like that, Modbus is a huge player. You still run into a lot of our big equipment in building automation, like boilers especially, that that's how they communicate is still Modbus. So. Is that the one that works? I noticed on all the EEPs, the spoiler and the EEP controllers, all the EPRs, electronics, all those stuff we noticed. Like all Modbus? Yep. Oh man, do I have a project for my advanced refrigeration students? Go away. I love making my advanced refrigeration students do controls work. It's far more exciting for me. <laughs>
All right. So, as Andy told us, BACnet was created by ASHRAE and is immensely imp uh, popular here in North America, um, which is completely unsurprising when you realize that ASHRAE is this, the group of engineers um, who also happen to write the specifications for buildings. And hey, I'm not knocking it. I think it's a great way to move. Um, and BACnet has displaced LAN as the predominant communication protocol for buildings here in the US and North America. I'm not going to promise anything as soon as you cross over into Europe or Asia. Those get a little different. So, I'm not saying they don't use BACnet. I'm not saying they don't use LAN, but there are other options over there too. One of the problems with BACnet um, is that it is open to the point of insecurity. Okay, and this brings comes back to that topic of VLANs, of walking oh, walking into the door of a network and do we have a hallway or do we have a warehouse? Because if somebody gets on to the same network, whether it's physical network or a virtual network, that you have backnet devices, you might as well just hand them the keys to the car. Because once a device is on a backnet network. It can talk to everything that's BACnet. It can change set points, it can override fan speeds, it can override dampers. Whatever you have the capability of doing within your system, it can do it. Okay? That is one of the biggest concerns with BACnet right now, is how insecure of a communication protocol it actually is. Ted, I can see you've got a question in your eyes. No. No? Just focusing? Just surprised. <laughs> yeah. It, it is one of those things that we really, I'd say it's an industry, a dark industry secret, but we don't make a secret of it. That's why I made that statement about security. Yes. Yeah, I'm really, I, I think of all of the groups working to further develop BACnet, I think that group that's working on security and encryption is the most important. You can say that with anything, like you had a medicine system, if you had a medicine protocol, you know, whatever, and got in the door, you kept basically the same method, the same thing. Not... I mean, you're basically just saying, as long as you get into it and you have the same protocol, the door's open. Not necessarily, no. Um, the way some of the other... How do I want to phrase this? Um, with BACnet, every uh, if, if this VAV is a BACnet VAV, and I know that it is, all you have to do is ask it, hey, what do you want to talk about? And it will spill its guts yeah. about what it wants to talk about. Yeah, like the lights at the Super Bowl. Yes, like the lights at the Super Bowl. There are other systems that are designed where that controller may need you to tell it specifically, I want to talk about this before it's going to talk back to you. Um, instead of the database existing in the controller, the database may exist on a server. Kind of, yes. Yeah. But, but if you got front at the front door and you're in there and you have that thing, you know, yes. you're talking with the same software, you got it. You, you still got the same thing. Yes, but the difference is BACnet, if we're using the front door situation, BACnet right now is like having no door in the front. Well, yeah. Okay. I agree with we, that. We, we rely yeah. on... Um, the implementation by the controls contractor and that particular networking or who IT department yeah, it, it, to build a door patch. Open. It's, Correct. It's open. Yeah. Correct. With other protocols, there's at least already a door there. Um, you may be able to lock it. You may have a dog, uh, you know, a Rottweiler backing up that locked door. That it really depends. Um, so. Within, 
I'm agreeing with you while disagreeing with you. It, it, it is, if you can get in deep enough into a system, yes. But that applies to anything. So, so it seems to me uh, that wiring is relatively inexpensive. And while you're not going to air gap the system because you need to communicate with it, it does seem that you should, that you could set it up so that there were gateways mm -hmm. that were secure. And try, because look, Ashley is not going to be able to make a decision on security before that security issue is like is gone. Mm -hmm. Past, you know, even you know, even now with security, on, oh yeah, the there's no the, the decisions are made really slowly, but actually it's particularly slow on decision making because they're a very deliberate body. But the gateway, having some sort of gateway, seems like it would make sense that we're physically independent with the gateway. Correct. Into the law. And there are systems that do implement that. Because you're absolutely right. The um, security developments that are being worked on with BACnet right now should have been done 10 years ago, like done and implemented 10 years ago. But they're, the, but they're, but they're, they're five the years out. Just a little chain on the door that somebody can. There's two words that sum it all up. What was there? That's all it comes out to. <laughs> so. We, we, could, we could debate this one and how to fix it 10 ways from Sunday. But I just want you to be aware that, you know, BACnet is not secure. Um, now, also this last point, commonly misunderstood in the design community. Okay? So people like, I don't want to say Andy, he should know a lot better than this. But I have run into a lot of engineers who, when they specify BACnet, think, hey, I specify BACnet. Any control company can come in and do anything within this building. And if the owner doesn't like that control company, they can kick them out and get somebody else the next day, and they will have full capability within the building. That just isn't so which is why we have our next two slides. What BACnet is? BACnet, I think Andy did a great job of explaining this, so I'm not going to belabor the point terribly. But it's a series of standards to facilitate communication between devices. That is all BACnet is. It is communication protocol. Okay? Um, it specifies how to initiate that conversation and maintain that conversation. It has a bunch or a series of device profiles um, that kind of define what a device is. Is it an operator workstation? Okay, kind of their category along the lines of supervisor. Is it an application controller? Is it something specifically programmed to deal with a fan coil unit? Or is it a smart thermostat? Things along those lines. There are about, I don't know, eight or ten device profiles right now in BACnet. They also include the objects that each device supports. Okay? These are things like analog values, binary values, the data points within. Okay? Yeah. Um, there are, I believe, 60 different data types within BACnet. And so for if you try and count and think, there's a lot of really esoteric stuff within BACnet if you really get into it. Um, Multi-states are a common one. Analog and binary values, inputs, outputs, things like that are very commonly used. Um, schedules and trends and alarms are some that are additionally, you know, kind of common. And then there's some stuff out there that is just completely rare that Yep, it sure exists on that standard, uh-huh. That's probably the only place you'll ever see it. I said next slide. Okay. What BACnet isn't? BACnet is not a software package. Okay. 
So if you have Johnson Metasys, yes, Johnson Metasys may also talk BACnet. It may also talk Want, but that does not mean that you can come in with an Andover BACnet program and take over everything that the Johnson Metasys system is doing. Okay? It is not a programming language. Just because this Honeywell controller in the ceiling here talks BACnet does not mean we can come in with an easy I.O. programming tool and program that controller. Okay? That is one of those things that I think at least a long time ago some engineers got very confused about. Okay? Um, and I think that was probably some fairly intentional obfuscation from the part of manufacturers. Okay? I don't blame the engineers for it in the slightest. I actually was asked to guest lecture at University of Nebraska to a high-level engineering class. And what I decided to talk about was BACnet. And when I got to information like this, I think the um, PhD holding mechanical engineer, professional engineer, who was teaching the class was writing more notes about stuff to look up than all of the students combined. Because he was ask, he was making comments like, really? What? No, it's not that. Yeah, it actually is. Okay. Last of all, BACnet is not a guarantee that the device you are talking to is going to tell you what you want to hear. Okay? Just because that occupancy sensor in the ceiling is BACnet enabled, it is an uh, application controller, just because it's there and it supports binary values does not mean that it actually has to tell you the occupancy state of this room. That is entirely up to the manufacturer. Okay? Now something with a small device like that, way less likely to be of concern. Big equipment, rooftop units, boilers, chillers. There is a huge amount of data that would be really useful to have access to within those systems, right? About 100 set points a piece, um, statuses on condenser fans, you know, pressures within the refrigeration system, pressure within the boiler if it's a steam boiler. All of those kind of things would be really useful to have, right? Well, that doesn't mean the manufacturer wants to give you access to them. Okay? Whether they just didn't think about it or didn't want to. Or nobody wants to integrate it. That's another issue, is from the integration standpoint, it may not, you know, just have been brought over. That data may exist. Yeah. Okay. So, important things. Um, and they're important things because, and I think they're important because they are issues that I have had to fight in the industry. So warning your students that they may have to fight issues like this. Misinformation, misunderstanding. Yep. 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 And um, this is a, it can be an exceptionally hard fought battle from a building operator standpoint. You know, they walk up to a modern chiller and they've got this touch screen that gives them so much data that it'll make their heads explode. And it's got all that data. And they'll ask the control technician, can you duplicate that screen on the building automation system so I don't have to walk down here to the chiller? And get out my earplugs. Okay. I don't think it's that hard to get to the chiller most of the time, but hey, I get it. Being optimal with your time is important. 
and sometimes we can recreate that screen to an extent. But it's very rare that we can actually fully do it. Okay. And that is true of every control system that I have worked with. Even if it is a train chiller and a train control system, and they're talking train proprietary communication directly to that chiller, that does not mean you will get all the data you want. Use a word like and how to lock it down to Yep. Just because you want to talk about it doesn't mean the controller does. Okay? So. All right. Making sense so far? Does that jive with, you know, kind of dovetails into what Andy said a little bit and kind of stomps on his parade a little bit too, unfortunately. He but, said something that was very telling, right, when uh, Bob asked him about uh, his favorite light red uh, discovery tool. Discovery tool? Yep. Uh, I, I don't actually do that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, he's the president. I think he's an excellent representative for BACnet. I think he's probably would make an amazing salesperson. <laughs> uh, so, so I, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, so if you're these discovery tools, mm -hmm. they go out and just query everything out, find it, query everything on the network? We're just about to talk about okay. it. Okay. So this, are we ready to move on? Questions so far? Okay. If my soapboxing gets irritating, please make Bob throw something at me or something. He, he doesn't have a problem throwing things, so just give him a look and he'll, he'll take care of it. Okay? All right. Ramiro. Have you had any success in working with the manufacturers to open a certain point that you really want to see? No. So. Romero over there in left field asked, have I personally had luck working with manufacturers to open up a specific data point that, I, that maybe an engineer specified or a building operator really wants? And the answer to that is a resounding no. Yeah. I've got, I've got, you have to get to the right department. I mean, you ask the question to the first 25 people, none of them even know what you're talking about, so it doesn't matter. Well, you have to just keep asking. It's like calling your cable service provider, expecting to get somewhere. You know, that's what it turns into. Yeah, but generally, um, that is an extremely uphill battle, and it kind of goes along the lines of what Andy said. We can integrate anything with enough time and enough money. Right. Um, the unfortunate thing is that often, by the time you get to the point where you can get to that data point it may have been more cost effective to rip the factory controls off of that piece of equipment and replace them completely with your control system. And I have definitely been party to that more than once, um, especially on things like small rooftop units. Um, or you just piggyback another sensor on that and get pick up that. Yes, or you install an additional sensor to pull it in. Yep, that, yes. Doesn't work really well for set points, though. What? Installing an additional sensor doesn't work really well for set points, though. All right. Great question, Romero. I, I sorry, I had to give you a negative answer, but all right. So, in BACnet, every device is a client or a server or both. Don't worry about both for right now. So, think about web pages, okay? When you want data from eBay, you go and you talk to eBay's server, right? Okay. You go to... 
You, you go to a restaurant. Okay? Who has the food? The server. You want the food? You work through the server, right? Okay. You at the restaurant are a client. So you want the food? The client talks to the server. Okay. Your data is the food. What's the, what's the master controller of all IT? <laughs> don't ask questions that don't exist. <laughs> Okay, so use, use whatever reference. Server is the one that has the data, always. If you have the data, then you're the server. If Bob has the data, Bob is the server. If I want the data, I am the client. This is as bad as the problem. <laughs> yes, is yes, as it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, so. Servers have the data. In BACnet, almost every device will be a server. Okay? Not everything, but almost everything. Clients are far less common. This VAV controller in the ceiling, it's BACnet. It is a server. It does not have the capability of being a client. It cannot ask the VAV over in that room for anything. It just has data that it wants to send out. Okay? The supervisory controller, like our Bass View, like a Jace, like what's a Johnson one? Uh, NAE. NAE. Those are the clients. Okay? And in BACnet, the client is the one that starts the conversation. The client is the one that shows up on the network and goes, hey, who wants to talk? Okay. So, once the conversation is started, a client can write data back to a server. Okay, but that is still acting as a client. The server has to have that data originally for the client to be able to do anything with it. Bob. Chime for uh, the, you can't get the Bass 22s. If you're ordering them, they can upload the firmware to make the 22 a client. You know. That's good to know, because it didn't used to be that way. They were just strictly a server. Yeah. So that is awesome. I love it when companies develop to further meet the potential for their hardware. That makes me very, very happy because that is something the building automation industry does not do very well. Okay. Devices. <laughs> That's fair. You don't have to be. You just have to live with it for the rest of your life. True. So, devices get added to our client. Okay. The way this happens is, like I said, the client shows up on the network and says, hey, who is? That's literally the name given to the command. It is a network broadcast. So we're talking UDP here. So here's, here's our examples of UDP versus uh, TCP. So the client shows up on the network, says, just yells out across the entire network that it has access to. Who is? And just sits there and listens and waits. And every server that hears that who is question replies back with a statement, I am. Okay? It has some basic information about the device. It has the device's address, the device's name if it has a name, and what type of device it is. Um, also, I think manufacturer is included in that data as well. Okay. At that juncture in time, normally through some configuration relying on the technician setting things up, the client can establish a long-term connection with that device. And 
maintain an ongoing conversation. When we start maintaining that ongoing um, communication, we move from a broadcast type communication to a directed communication. So we've moved from our UDP protocol to our TCP. Okay? We are directly connected. If, I, if Bob is a device and I am a client, I say, who is? Bob responds, I am. Hey, I want to keep talking. So we continue the conversation. Steve? Second bullet point. Mm -hmm. Any client receiving here? Is that supposed to be serpent? Yes. Okay. Yes. Getting confused already. That's fair. <laughs> when, when, when the presenter makes an error on their slides, that would make sense. Okay. Yeah. Right. No, that should definitely be um, serpent. It was late. So now there is a challenge with who is. I said who is is a broadcast to the network the server lives on. Okay? What happens if you have a client that's outside of that network? They're never going to get the broadcast because what one of the things that um, routers especially do is they limit that broadcast traffic. Because if you start getting a lot of broadcast traffic on your network, it's going to chew up a lot of bandwidth and crash the network, to Bob's point about Modbus and Proficon. Profitbus, sorry. Okay? So we try to limit our broadcast traffic. We, kind of corral it. Okay. And if we need to get information outside of our network, we have to use a directed message to that controller. So we have to know that that controller exists. Okay. Could you use the post office to explain this concept? Like the post Enlighten me. When they, you know, how do you ride down to the supervisor Servers, you know, all of your basic servers on your handlers, whatever else, your DAV boxes, and you go back like a postal code. You know, how does the mailman get back in town? So that's something you can have with kind of like a pretty cool way to do it. I like that. Using like a parcel service. You can do. Yeah, I like that a lot. You can't just deliver something from LA to, let's say, Minneapolis, Wisconsin. You got to get it all the way to that mailbox. Who's in charge of that mail distribution area? I think that's a great analogy. I like it. So, um, there is a, de uh, a device defined within BACnet that allows us to communicate between two different networks. We have to have one device on each of those networks that is a designated BBMD. Am I okay to erase what's on the board? Assuming the board will erase. I'll tell you what, these fancy glass whiteboards, they look really cool, but Give me the old classic kind every day. So, BBMD. Any guess what the first B is? Backnet. And the official spelling for Backnet is capital B A C lowercase N E T. Don't ask me why they did that. Then. <laughs> But BACnet broadcast management device. Okay? So if we were to draw out network A and draw out network B, if we have a server, or sorry, a client over here on network A, 
it sends out its who is. Everything in A hears that. If we have devices over here in B, that's a different network. They don't get the message. Okay? And this also applies for those of you who asked questions about subnetworks earlier. Subnets will also filter out broadcast traffic because it is effectively a different network. Okay? So what we have to do is we have to designate a controller. I'm just going to call them M because I didn't draw my circles big enough to do BBMD and have you be able to read it. If we designate these two controllers as BBMD, what happens is when we get the who is coming from our client, this device says, oh, that's a who is, that's broadcast. I need to proliferate that message. Okay. So what it does is it looks at its t internal table of, do I know any other BBMD devices? Okay. All right, I know about this guy. I'm going to send a directed message over TCP, which will transfer across networks, to this guy over here. Okay. This guy over here gets the, BB or the broadcast message and says, okay, I will send it out on my network. Okay. The other thing to know when this one gets, the BBMD gets the message, it will also resend it out on its network. Okay. That's important. Does that make sense? Why does it resend it out? Because that's how it was designed. Because that's the job of the BBMD is to register any other BBMD devices and to rebroadcast the who is. So on this network, you will get an, ex or an echo IM. Okay? So you'll get, for every device on this network over here, you will get two IM coming back to the server. Okay? You would think that would be a problem. It really isn't. Sean? Is this supposed to be structured like building the building, building the zone? Like, how do we even have to break that up? Or does it not matter? Um, it is going to be determined by how your um, IT department designs their network. Oh, great. And on, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, IT in the way again. Okay, so it's on the back. It's on the back. It's like routing tables, right? Yes, so yes. It absolutely is. So it's an it's only raison d'être as we do this, right? It's an infant that device just does that. No. Um, this device is all is probably a or server on this network as well. So oftentimes you will designate like um, a um, plant controller or a su small building level supervisory controller as a BBMD for that building or that floor. So it's a, it can be a function within it. Yes. It's not yeah. Most of the time it is literally a checkbox on most systems. Is it, does it have a list of commands that it will and will not broadcast uh, or, or relay? Yeah. So I, know it's gonna, I know it's gonna broadcast the uh, relay to who, uh, who is. Is it, are there things that it won't? Broadcast. Um, any uh, broadcast data that is tagged as BACnet, okay. it will rebroadcast. Okay. Now, that being said, I can't think of any other broadcast besides who is that BACnet uses. Because again, we try and limit broadcast traffic to not clog up our network. Okay. So, you see what happens here between our networks. Other questions so far? It still needs a byway between the two. Correct. This BBMD must know about this BBMD to tell it anything. Yes. And these networks do have to be connected by some level of media. Yes. Okay. Now, it doesn't have to be directly, but it has to get there. No, there, there just has to be some path for it to get to. Yes. If 
probably one of the hardest concepts like this to get across to students to understand. If you, if you think of a school system, it's real easy to just say this is a school district, right? Mm -hmm. This is school A, B, C, D, E, and then all the devices lay under each one of those schools and children. Yep. Just drafting architecture first. It's, well, where's Larry? I need to give us a class. So for reference, another good um, way to communicate it oftentimes is um, a high-rise building. Yep. Each floor is a separate network. That's another one to communicate with. Okay. And the truth is, both can be the case. You can have a different sub-network within, on each floor of 10 stories of building, and you can have two identical buildings. And they can both be on the same net. So, piano, the control of the controller also be You mean the client up here? Yeah. Yes. And oftentimes systems will enable that capability. And, and that would save from multiple broadcasts of who is on one that particular network? It could, but you also have to be careful. Because let's come back to this, because that's a great segue into the next one. So if this device is also a BBMD, Okay, it sends out the who is, this BBMD catches it, sends it out onto that network again, so now we do have two who is going on. What's going to happen when that who is comes up to our client? It's going to rebroadcast it because that's its job as a BBMD, because it's a computer, it's going to do exactly what you tell it to. So this is going to rebroadcast and send it back out, what happens when it gets here? Bing, 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 bing. It's a thing called a broadcast storm. And it is a phenomenal way to piss off IT like you would not believe. <laughs> because you can crash a network with that. Yeah, like, oh, my, 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 where I was going with that is Eliminate the second BBMD and connect directly from that controller to the other network. True. You only need one post office per location. But, but yeah. you can only have one post office per location, right? No, you can correct. multiple if you don't play your cards right. That's what yeah. you're saying. Right? Yeah. You can, but you should. Yeah. Correct. Uh, correct. And the, the reality in, so if this is a Let's say this is a medium-sized commercial building, okay, or a large commercial building. Most of the time, this client doesn't actually live within this network bubble because IT has thrown you off on a server over here. So you're actually in a separate to begin with. I'm not saying I like it, it's just how they do it. Make it sense? Lan. Can you, can you uh, I might have used it, but can you explain a little bit more in detail about the uh, uh, broadcast message and the direct message? Sure. Do you have a specific question with it? Um, well, I thought in the case of a router, if it's a broadcast message, it ignores it. If it's a direct message at the router, then it um, it doesn't, so you are correct in that a router will ignore broadcast messages. So think about the, broad, uh, the router as um, a bridge between two networks. If the network um, on Brooklyn Island, right, this, this is going to be my ignorance from class, Brooklyn is an island, right? Manhattan Island. There we go. Thank you. I knew I was wrong there somehow. Manhattan Island okay, is one of our networks. We've got a bridge that goes across. If we broadcast in Manhattan Island, the bridge, the router, ignores it. It's like that business belongs to Manhattan Island. We're ignoring it. Doesn't matter. Okay. If it is a directed message, if we have a taxi going across 
taking a message from Manhattan to Brooklyn, then the bridge lets it through. But it does have to be a directed message. The router does not... I have to be careful with this. If the router knows where that taxi is going, it will just let it continue on straight. If that taxi isn't entirely sure where it's going, then the router will create a broadcast saying, hey, I've got this message. I don't know where to send it. Where the hell's Brooklyn? Make sense? Did that help or hurt? Yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> Yes. Yes, they do. So, did it answer the question enough? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'll call it a win and run away before you ask another question then. <laughs> so, we okay? Oh, and I should specify this I am here is not broadcast. Because as part of the who is, the who is message also includes who the client is and their address who, of, that they're asking from. So when this client sends out the broadcast, part of that message is where to call back to. Okay, Think about it like um, you're listening to a radio station and they're doing a sweepstakes giveaway to the seventh caller who calls this number. Okay. The IM is the calling back to the radio station. Okay? So it is a directed connection based message. It's not a broadcast anymore. Once a client knows about one or more devices, well, knowing about that I've got a VAV here is important. But it's certainly not anything, everything we want to talk about to that VAV, is it? Because that VAV has data. So far, we only know that the VAV exists. So the next step is for the client to ask the device, the server, what data do you have? And for whatever reason, the title of that message is, who has? Okay. And client sends the who has to the server. The server, like I said, barfs its guts. This is everything I have to talk about. Everybody remember the Goonies movie? Remember when Chunk is getting his hand threatened to be fed in the blender and they tell him to spill his guts and he tells him every bad thing he ever did? <laughs> That's the response to who has. I can't use that reference with the students. Nobody's seen Goonies anymore. <laughs> so, anyway, server sends back the list of all of its objects that it has, okay, with some rudimentary data about those objects. What type of an object is it? Is it a binary value, or is it a trend, or is it an alarm? It has the current value of that data point. It may have its range, and whether that data point is a read-only point or writable. Okay. The client then, or we on the client's behalf, select what of those data points we want to continue monitoring in the future. We are literally going to say, I want to continue monitoring the room temperature from this room 114 VAV. I'm going to pull that in drop it into my client. The client then continues to monitor that data point ad infinitum. Okay? For as long as that VAV continues talking, the client is going to continue getting data about that room temperature. Okay? And of course, because nothing is simple, there are two ways that that, can, that continuation can happen. It can be set up so that every, you know, 10 seconds or 20 seconds or every one second, the client asks the VAV, hey, what's the room temperature? Hey, what's the room temperature? Hey, what's the room temperature? OK? 
okay? If you don't have a lot of data you're trying to pull on your network, that's an okay way to do it. The other way is for the VAV to monitor the room temperature, and when it changes enough, whatever we've set up, maybe it's when that room temperature changes two-tenths of a degree, the VAV says, hey boss, I got an update for you. Here's the data. That is generally a much more efficient way to do that communication. And that is a um, change of state type or change of value type COV um, data transfer. Where's the PLC on this? And that is one of the huge key differences between your average DDC controller versus a PLC. PLC is designed for manufacturing, process control, and they need data. They, they're, they're all about the data and fast action. Us here in temperature controls, what's one second versus ten? So the VAV in that case acts mm -hmm. as a client. No. To the server, which is the day, which is the room temperature. No, because the room in most situations is directly connected to the VAV, so it's not using back. Correct. So then, when it gets when the change is, then it's, it says, "Okay, I am now the client. And I'm going to call." Nope. It is a server sending that data out on a pre-existing connection. It doesn't have to call up. The client the, establish the connection, leaves the connection open. Effectively, yes. It's but that's it's that's when that the client it, is actually reading it, and you're setting it up in the programming. And if you're pulling that point across the network, maybe that's what you're not. It's that's a disconnect. It, I think the uh, thermostat is integral to the VAV. Right. That's yes. Yeah. yeah. The. But you could have conceivably you could have a back that device that you're. That's the your yes. Yeah. Yes. And so then it would be correct. And, and maybe a better way to phrase it instead of there being an always open connection between the VAV and the client is more like when the client discovered the VAV to begin with, it built a road to the client or to the SERP, to the VAV. So there's a road now between the two of them. So it can send data both ways without having to rebuild that road every time. So the original client would, yes. it does not have to pull the server every time once it's already made that connection. So the data can originate at the VAV on a, on a, on a, at an unknown point. Yes. Go back to the server and be, or to the, to the client. To the client. Yep. And, okay. Yes. And I'm just translating because I write this kind of control stuff in Python for yes. you know, Arduinos or for yep. pies and things like that. Yep. And it's a polling sequence or an interrupt sequence. And that's, uh, yes. Okay. Correct. Now, I will say that it is not great practice to have all of, to rely completely on a change of value because if all of your points within a server or change of value, and you the client doesn't hear from the server, you know, after a certain amount of time, did nothing change at the server, or did we lose communication with the server? So an occasional pull from the client to the server saying, hey, you still there? Or updating all of its points that it's monitoring every minute or five minutes or something is, very so common. There's nothing built in back then that, that does that kind of polling connection and ascertaining the connectivity in the protocol. It has to be done at the, at the next layer. No, there is. There, there definitely is a, a um, loss of communication type monitoring system built into the protocol. But oftentimes that is so background that you can have lost communication with the device, but if you don't have some way to report that 
to the end user, the only way they're going to know is if they lose the data off of their user interface. Does that make sense? It, it does. It, okay. Translation is going a little tough in my mind, but I... Other questions? Because it, it's, it's ugly, isn't it? <laughs> that's that's a great question. We've covered a lot of information. Do we need to take a break? Okay. Let's take a break. We're actually I think we're right on time for a break, aren't we? Five minutes early. But it's a good stopping point. Let's take a break. Come back in fifteen minutes. <laughs>